The story of American funk and soul would be incomplete without Sly Stone and his highly successful band. From shutting down shows like Woodstock to building one of the largest music fan base in the world, Sly's legacy is etched in marble. But how did a young boy brought up in a religious home become one of the most popular psychedelic acts in the world? And why did he throw all that success away in the blink of an eye? This is not your typical fairy tale, but a dark story involving gangsters, drugs, and the dark side of the music industry. This is the life and tragic ending of Sly Stone, genesis of the Family Stone. Sly Stone became a household name back in the 60s and 70s thanks to his highly successful band Sly and the Family Stone and their countless hit records. During this era, he became the face of funk with his incredible fusion of soul, rock, psychedelic music, creating this unique blend that took America in a chokehold, making Sly one of the most successful music artists in Hollywood history. But before the world knew him as Sly Stone, he was simply Sylvester Stewart. Born on March 15, 1943, to Casey and Alpha Stewart in Denton, Texas, Sly's family would later move to Vallejo, California in the North Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area. Sly and his four other siblings were brought up in a deeply religious home, a factor that played a huge role in his musical journey. As part of the doctrines of the Church of God in Christ, which the family attended, all the children were given the avenue to express themselves musically. This marked Sly's early entry into the world of music, giving him a taste of what it feels like to make melodies that are both soothing and exhilarating. Along with his older brother Freddie and their sisters Rose and Loretta, Sly formed his first music band ever, and they were called The Stuart Four. Together, they performed gospel music in their church and gradually became known beyond their locale. Music for them was more than a child's hobby, and they even recorded a single local release 78 RPM single titled On the Battlefield and Walking with Jesus' Name. This was way before Sly became the funk star that we know him as today. Of all his siblings though, only the eldest sister Loretta ended up not pursuing a music career. Every single person from Freddie to their youngest sister Vayetta dipped their feet in the music world and each made their marks although Sly is inarguably the most successful. Musical Prodigy From his very early days, Sly displayed exceptional musical abilities so impressive that many even considered him a prodigy. To put that into perspective, at the age of seven he had already attained a level of proficiency on the keyboards, and by the time he turned 11, he could play the guitar, bass, and drums as well, to a professional level. While still in high school, Sly began to focus primarily on the guitar as his instrument of choice, and he even joined a number of high school bands back then. One of those bands was known as Viscanes, a doo-wop group in which Sly and his friend Frank Arellano, who was Filipino, were the only non-white members. Viscanes was one of those hip bands that embraced racial diversity, adding to their public appeal. This band also formed the blueprint of Sly's family stone, incorporating the multicultural ideal that remains an inseparable aspect of the Family Stone's legacy. During this period, the Viscanes released a few local singles, including Yellow Moon and Stope What You Are. After a while, Sly left the group and briefly pursued a solo career under the name Danny Stewart, releasing a couple of solo singles that didn't really break into the open market. After experimenting with making music on his own, Sly would later form several short-lived bands with his brother Fred, like the Stewart Brothers. Upon graduating from high school, he furthered his musical interest by studying music at the Vallejo campus of Solano Community College. But how did the name Sly come to be, and why did he stick with it all his life? Well, that's a story that takes us back to his grade school days, when a classmate misspelt his name Sylvester as Slyvester, Sly loved the nickname and it has followed him ever since, before the boy became a star. Every superstar you see today had to work regular jobs before fame, and for Sly Stone, that job was as a disc jockey. His love for music couldn't keep away from anything musically oriented, and so in the mid-1960s, Sly began working as a DJ at the Soul radio station KSOL in San Francisco, 
where he included white performers such as The Beatles and The Rolling Stones in his playlist, exemplifying the same racial diversity we talked about earlier, which became a part of his legacy. But Jing wasn't going to pay all the bills, so at the same time, Sly was holding down a job as a staff record producer for a label known as Autumn Records. Employing his musical genius, Sly produced music for the predominantly white bands in the San Francisco area, including the Bo Brumels, the Mojo Men, Bobby Freeman, and Grace Slick's first band, The Great Society. His influence on the label was pretty remarkable, and he initiated the movement that transformed KSL Ann into soul music, and he started calling the station K-Soul, which fits the brand even more. Sly also knew how to manage multiple interests, so while he provided music for the mind, body, and soul on K-Soul, he still played the keyboard for countless performers like Dionne Warwick, Righteous Brothers, Ronettes, Bobby Freeman, Marvin Gaye, Freddie Cannon, and many, many more. Sly's influence was so widespread even before he became extremely famous on his own that he even played at the Twist Party concerts held by Chubby Checker at the San Francisco Cow Palace back in 1962 and 63. This also offered him access to some of the greatest musicians of the time, a league that he would soon become a part of. Sly and the Family Stone, the origin story. In the year 1996, Sly Stone formed a band called Sly and the Stoners, which included Cynthia Robinson on the trumpet. On the other hand, Freddie, Sly's brother, also formed a separate band known as Freddie and the Stone Souls, with Greg Errico on the drums and Ronnie Crawford on the saxophone. But then, Stone's friend and saxophonist Jerry Martini brought the idea of merging the two bands together to form one epic musical band that would shake the world with their sweet melodies and psychedelic music. The agreement was finalized in November 1966, and this was the birth of Sly and the Family Stone. At first, they were called the Sly Brothers and Sisters, but after playing their first gig at the Winchester Cathedral, a nightclub in Redwood City, California, they made the unanimous decision to change the name to what we know today. Every member of the band had their unique roles and responsibilities, and since Sly and Freddie both played the guitar, Sly appointed Freddie as the official guitarist for the Family Stone, while he taught himself to play the electronic organ. Remember Cynthia Robinson, who originally played the trumpet for Sly's band? Her cousin Larry Graham was also invited as a bass guitarist for the band, as they transformed into a musical powerhouse unlike anything the world has ever seen. For the background vocals, Sly called upon his youngest sister, Vietta, who also desperately wanted to be a part of the band. Vietta and her friends Mary McCreary and Elva Mouton had initially created a gospel group called the Heavenly Tones, but they soon became known as the Little Sister, the Family Stone's background vocalists. The group eventually hit it big after a thrilling performance at the Winchester Cathedral, where they caught the attention of CBS Records executive David Kapralik, who signed them to Epic Records' label, beginning their professional music career. However, their early days didn't record as much success. The Family Stone's first album, A Whole New Thing, was released the following year in 1967, and it received critical acclaim, especially from musicians like Mose Allison and Tony Bennett. But unfortunately, that didn't translate into a huge success as expected, and due to the low sales, the band was restricted to playing in small venues and clubs. Seeing how the band struggled to achieve commercial success, Clive Davis and the record label decided to intervene, talking Sly into writing and recording a record that would take the world by storm. This move gave birth to the Family Stone's iconic single dance to the music, a massive hit that took the band from here to there. It became their first charting single, reaching number eight on the Billboard Hot 100, which was a really huge deal for the band back then. Shortly before the song was released, Sly and the Family Stone welcomed another member to the band, Rose Stone. Rose was initially reluctant to leave her job at a local record store, but after being constantly pestered by her brothers, she gave in to their requests and became the group's vocalist and keyboardist. The hit single dance to the music was followed up by an album of the same name, and it went on to record decent sales. But the same couldn't be said for the follow-up album, Life, which turned out to be a flop. However, 
The band would soon hit gold just a few years later with the release of their hit single Everyday People, which became their first Billboard number one entry and still remains one of Family Stone's most influential songs of all time. Everyday People spoke about the systemic prejudice that had become a part of the American culture at this point, popularizing the catchphrase, different strokes for different folks. The band's message was of acceptance, tolerance, and mutual respect, despite mutual differences. The song also served as the lead single for Family Stone's third album, Stand, a highly successful project that sold over 3 million copies. The title track on the album peaked at number 22 in the United States, and it is considered one of the band's peak when it comes to artistic expression. Stand also contained some of the biggest songs ever released by the Family Stones, including I Want to Take You Higher, Don't Call Me Nig Asterisk Asterisk R Whitey, and You Can Make It If You Try. From here on, there was no more playing in clubs and small venues for the Family Stones. They started headlining huge shows and massive festivals, captivating the world with their enchanting melodies and unrivaled musical performances. In 1969, the band headlined the Harlem Cultural Festival, performing before tens of thousands of spectators at Mount Morris Park. However, their most unforgettable performance would come several weeks later at an event known as the Woodstock Festival, the Family Stone at Woodstock. The 1960s were filled with raving parties and festivals the world will never forget. The biggest of them all was the Woodstock Festival of 1969, held on a dairy farm property in Bethel, New York. Between August 15 and 18, 1969, over 500,000 people partied with some of the biggest music stars of the time. Jimi Hendrix, The Who, Jefferson Airplane, Janis Joplin, and of course, Sly and the Family Stone. It was very late on Saturday, August 16, when the band took the stage, led by Sly Stone. The first thing that caught the attention of the crowd was the fact that the Family Stone consisted of both white and black members, which was very rare at the time. Being one of the last performers to grace the stage, the Family Stone's performance became one of the most powerful and remarkably fresh performances of the festival, and the memories still linger in our collective consciousness even after so many years have passed. Their mix of soul, R and B, and psychedelic elements took the drugged-out crowd to the very edge of the universe, immersing them in a musical experience that was literally out of this world. The performance also brought the band even more popularity, introducing them to a wider audience. The set list for the performance majorly consisted of songs from their latest hit album, Stand, including fan favorites like Music Lover and I Want to Take You Higher. By the summer of 1969, Sly and the Family Stone were one of the biggest names in the music industry, and the Woodstock appearance only solidified their legacy. Following the Woodstock performance, Sly and the Family Stone also appeared at the Summer of Soul concerts in Harlem, and once again, they dazzled the crowd of over 300,000 people with their electric performance. They soon began touring with their highly successful album Dance With The Music, and during one of those tours in 1973, iconic reggae legend Bob Marley and his band The Wailers opened for them, making that the first time Bob Marley would perform in the United States. The song would eventually hit the top of the Billboard Hot 100 in early 1970, as well as reaching the number five spot on the R&B chart and selling over a million copies. So it's safe to say that Thank You was pretty successful. However, the fans kept demanding new materials, so in order to appease them, Epic Records began re-releasing the old materials, starting with A Whole New Thing, which was reissued with a new cover. Then several of Family Stone's hit records were also packaged into a greatest hits album that reached number two on the Billboard 200 back in 1970. But just when everyone thought Sly and the Family Stone was going under, they came up with a huge surprise in 1971. There's a riot going on. When Sly and his band started recording their new album in record plant Sausalito back in 1970, they were on top of the world. But at the same time, the empire was being ripped open from the inside, and there were many people to blame for it. It was with this backdrop that the band started working on a project titled There's a Riot Going On 
which became one of their most successful albums ever. Just like with the previous albums, songwriting, arrangement, and production were overseen by Sly himself, but the progress was slow and frustrating for the labels. Added to that was the tension created by the presence of gangsters during recording, many of whom belonged to the Black Panther Party we talked about earlier. With a mix of slow progress, constant rifts between band members, and a crew that was more concerned with doing drugs than making music, work on the new album was delayed well into the following year, 1971. The label executives were tired at this point. Deadlines had been set for the album release, but they kept getting shifted since the songs were far from ready. There's a Riot going on would eventually be completed later in 1971, and when the label execs heard it, it turned out to be everything they wanted and more. The album was described as a delicious fusion of funk, soul, rock, psychedelia, and jazz. It had this darker, harder edge to it than the regular soulful-sounding music the band used to make. Fans also noted a considerable absence of the optimism and fun factor that was a major feature in the band's early music, which had now been replaced by a more pessimistic, even nihilistic tone. A new release date was immediately set for November 1971. However, there was one more hurdle the album needed to overcome. The critics. Unlike other works released by Sly and The Family Stone, this new album received divided reviews from music critics. On one hand, there were those who hailed it as a masterpiece, while others weren't so convinced by the new sound and style. But contrary to critical reviews, the fans absolutely loved the album. On the day of its release, the album shot to the top of the US Billboard 200, as well as the R&B charts. Fast forward to November 1972, just a year later, and There's a Riot Going On had sold millions of records, earning a gold certification. Shortly after that, they sold even more and earned a platinum certification. Family Affair, the lead single off the album, reached number one on the US Billboard's 100 charts and number three on the R&B chart. Although it may have taken way too long to complete, the album turned quite well and it totally transformed the career of Sly and the Family Stone. The Demise of Sly and the Family Stone Following the unexpected success of the band, record label executives were excited to see what else Sly and his band had in store. By June 1973, their sixth studio album, Fresh, was ready to hit the stores, however. Sly seemed to be getting increasingly dissatisfied with the band's output. The album kept getting delayed by his constant remixes, and even after he handed over the master tapes, he continued to remix the album. And that's why you will find several versions of each track on Fresh today. It turned out to be a more upbeat album, and the critics loved it. It also became one of the most impressive works put out by the band, and following its release on June 30, 1973, it reached the number 7 spot on the US Billboard 200. A couple other hit projects were released after this, but then the band's attitude to shows began to take its toll. Even though their music was still selling, their live shows started selling fewer and fewer tickets, and several promoters stopped booking them altogether. The final straw was on January 15, 1975, when the band booked the Radio City Music Hall in New York for a show. This was one of the most prestigious music events in the city, but unfortunately, by the time Sly and the Family Stone got on stage, they discovered that only about one-eighth of the crowd showed up. It was so bad that they had to scrape together the money to get home. On their return to California, a unanimous decision was made to dissolve the band. And after eight years and eight studio albums, the world finally said goodbye to Sly and the Family Stone. But if you thought this was where the story ended, you'd be very, very wrong. The Boy Who Became a Legend The band's demise marked the beginning of a new chapter for Sly. And in these later years, he decided to strike out on his own as a solo artist. However, none of the four albums he released on his own recorded as much success as his earlier albums. He also faced some problems with the law in 1983 when he was arrested in Florida for cocaine possession marking a dark chapter in the life and tragic ending of Sly Stone. However, in 1993, Sly Stone became an inductee in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and that turned out to be his final public appearance for a long while. 
The next time the world got to see Sly Stone on stage again was in February 2, when he performed at the Sly and the Family Stone tribute at the 2006 Grammy Awards. At the same time, rumors began to emerge about his financial status, with many sources claiming that the superstar had become destitute and was dependent on welfare checks to survive. He would later re-emerge on the music scene in 2007 and has performed in several shows since then. The music icon is blessed with three children. Sylvester Stone, born in 1973 by Kathy Silva. Sylvette Stone, born in 1976 by fellow band member Kathy Robinson. And Novena Carmel, born in 1982. Today, Sly Stone is remembered as one of the most iconic musicians in American history, with a legacy that continues to inspire future superstars. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.